Is Intel the new top dog of the enthusiast desktop department? Today, we're gonna to be running the 12900K i9 benchmarks against the previous top dog, the Ryzen 9 5950X in a variety of games. So let's strap on in and get those benchmarks on the way. So starting off today's comparison, we've got here a Z690 motherboard from ASUS. This is the Strix E Gaming Edition. We're using DDR5 memory from Corsair. This is their new Dominator Platinum 5200 megahertz, two by 16 gigabyte sticks. Now you've also got the addition of having PCIe 5.0 introduced on this motherboard, but it doesn't make too much of a difference, just like PCIe 4.0 versus three didn't make much of a difference for games. Now we'll talk about productivity in a separate video because I'm actually still using an LGA 1200 socketed cooler on this motherboard. So I'm not entirely sure if the temperatures could get a whole lot better as I don't have a LGA 1700 official cooler on hand. So we'll have more testing on 12th gen later. So make sure you hit that sub button and ring that bell to stay tuned for the latest videos coming out here at Tech Yes City. But in the meantime, let's roll those numbers. And starting off here, we're going with the multiplayer popular title, Call of Duty Warzone. And here's where we saw 339 average FPS versus 284. The 0.1% and 1% lows were also better on the 12900K running this benchmark. Moving over to New World, we saw here 255 average FPS versus 238. And just like Call of Duty, the 1% and 0.1% lows did scale better over on the Intel system. And moving over to CSGO, yet another victory for the 12900K. This one being quite sizable at 795 average FPS versus 716. I also saw the highest 0.1% lows I've seen in this benchmark to date whilst running on the 12900K. So that was also quite a sizable victory. And then moving on to F1 2020 ultra low settings at 1080p, we got 383 average FPS versus 321. And then we had the 1% and 0.1% lows also better on the i9 system. Going over to Borderlands 3 ultra low settings, 1080p, 252 versus 214 though Borderlands 3 does have a bit of an issue I think in both DX12 and DX11 but DX12 does give better average FPS overall but also those 1% and 0.1% lows do suffer as we saw on both the Ryzen system and the Intel system in this particular benchmark but nonetheless the victory did go to the 12900K with the average FPS. Then moving over to the next title we got here Red 2 Demption 2 aka R2D2, we scored here 1080p very low settings, 178 average FPS versus 149. And because this benchmark is so long and it has cutscenes, we decided to use the minimum FPS, which is 114 versus 91 over on the Ryzen system. And then the last title we're pulling up here is Far Cry 6, where the i9-12900K yet again scored another victory. So it's showing that it's got not just better single core performance, but also better multi-core performance when it comes to gaming. And now some of you guys may be wondering why we're testing at 1080p lower settings. And this is because when they're not GPU bound, we're testing the CPU. So then the pressure falls off the GPU and goes to the CPU, which if we're doing a CPU review, we're testing that CPU performance. Though in the real world, a lot of gamers, especially casual gamers, will love just playing with something like 144 FPS. And here's where these CPUs and of course these graphics cards deliver amplitudes more than that. But of course, if you're a competitive gamer looking for that edge, then the i9-12900K will deliver in this aspect. So with those gaming numbers aside, we can see that Intel is delivering a big victory when the games enable that extra IPC, that extra performance to come through. But if you are wondering about the raw statistics on this CPU, well, here they are. Intel have officially announced now 
PL2 limits, which were previously undisclosed on their 11th gen and 10th gen CPUs, for example. This is essentially the maximum wattage you can push through on the turbo limits, which in this case is 241 watts. And so here we've got the boost clocks and the base clocks, which if you're looking at the PL1, which is your traditional TDP that was released in previous generations, this would be related to those base clocks. So we're seeing here out of the box on the performance cores, we've got 3.2 gigahertz on those eight cores. And then on the eight E cores, we've got 2.4 gigahertz base. Then we have 5.1 gigahertz all core boost for turbo or the PL2 limit on the performance cores. And this is the eight cores, 16 threads, by the way. And then we've got the eight cores, eight threads, boosting to a maximum of 3.9 gigahertz. Now in the test on Cinebench, which utilizes AVX2 instruction sets, I did see these boost speeds pretty much hit right on those stated numbers. So 5.1 gigahertz was being achieved on those eight performance cores, and then 3.9 gigahertz was being achieved on those efficiency cores. And they did state that the single core can go up to 5.2 gigahertz, which I did see momentarily in the single core Cinebench R23 run. Though speaking of those Cinebench R23 numbers, we'll pull up the numbers here, which is where the 12900K really does start to shine if we're looking at those raw improvements and what Intel has done on this CPU architecture. Well, we can see here that it's beating out now the 5950X, which in this case, we've seen AMD boast about how good their Cinebench R23 numbers are. And now it looks like it's Intel's time to say, hey, I'm coming to the table. But one interesting thing that Intel has done with Z690, or at least the consumer side CPUs, is that they've dropped the AVX512 support, which was previously in 11th gen. They must have figured that people using the mainstream desktop CPUs don't need this instruction set, so they went away with it. However, up until this point, you have heard me talk about these two different sets of cores. So this is a new design by Intel, essentially a tile design that's enabled them to introduce a whole new way of doing things with 12th gen. They've essentially structured two different sets of cores, which is known as performance cores, which if you were to think about 11th gen cores, for example, they would be very similar to your performance cores that are featured on the 12900K. In this case, you get eight of them and they do feature hyper-threading, eight cores, 16 threads. Then they've introduced smaller cores known as the E cores. Four of these would typically take up the same die space as a performance core, and you get eight of them. So essentially, in essence, you would have 10 performance cores being the same size as this 16 core 24 thread. Now it is a weird number to look at, 16 cores, 24 threads, because the efficiency cores don't have hyper-threading. But when we look at the raw numbers, the performance is definitely there. And this is also to thank to Intel using now their 10 nanometer process or what they call Intel 7. Though speaking of this introduction of 10 nanometer has also brought about power consumption where the Intel system, at least in the Cinebench R23 numbers, was running significantly more wattage through the whole system than the AMD system was coming in at 352 watts versus 238 watts. And now on that note of power consumption, I did decide to throw in on F1 2020 some power consumption results here too, whilst the games were running. And here's where the Ryzen 5950X also did a better job than the i9 system when it came to gaming whilst using power consumption. But I believe with these power consumption numbers, from total system power draw being lackluster, especially has to do with those motherboards, perhaps the PCIe 5 on board being so new, but like we saw with PCIe 4.0 versus 3.0, that ran hotter and used more power as well. So hopefully some BIOS updates come out in the pipeline and help reduce this power consumption for Intel so the 12900K can really start to shine at least not just in the numbers, but also the power consumption numbers and efficiency. Though if you guys are into synthetic benchmarks, then the last one I'll pull up for you is Fire Strike Extreme, where we saw here the physics scores going over 40,000 for the i9, and then on the Ryzen getting in the high 30,000. So this really cements the i9 as that all round gaming champion. Now in terms of the IPC and the 19% uplift, I am seeing definitely a massive uplift in performance over the previous 11th gen. However, like I said before, I am going to do a full suite of productivity benchmarks because I actually also want to start editing videos on this CPU and seeing if there are any drawbacks that things like benchmarks can't tell us. So all that out of the way, one thing is certain, the 12th generation CPUs from Intel definitely mean business and it's good to see them finally back in the game. 
And I feel like this whole new generation has opened up a Pandora's box of testing, which I look forward to giving you guys a heap more content on and looking at this processor and also other 12th gen processors a lot more in depth, pairing them in different situations to seeing what they really excel at, to seeing what you might not need to upgrade with. Now, speaking of upgrade, you're probably sitting there, should I upgrade to 12th gen? And here's where we're gonna talk about pricing, which if we look at the CPU, the raw cost of this CPU, it's actually looking like it's really good value for what it is. It's coming in with a price tag of around 600 US dollars. And if we look at that compared to the 5950X, it's coming in roughly $200 cheaper on the MSRP and $150 cheaper on the street price. And when we compare that to the Australian pricing, I've already got some numbers that are being open for pre-order and that's coming in around 999 Aussie dollars for the KF, which doesn't feature the onboard GPU portion, which we will be testing that out also as well. But I wanna do that on a budget CPU, not a high-end CPU, because I don't really imagine many people paying over 2000 Aussie dollars just to play on HD graphics. But if you do want the UHD 770 graphics, then you will have to fork out, and this is confirmed in Australia, an extra 60 Aussie dollars for that privilege. So the CPU on the surface looks really good, but that's kind of where the benefits start to fizzle out because when I looked for the cheapest motherboards available, at least for pre-order, the minimum entry point was around 500 Aussie dollars for a Z690 motherboard. So if you want to get a 12900K, then you're going to have to cough up quite a bit of money for a motherboard. And then you've also got DDR5 memory, which you'll at the very least want to get a 32 gigabyte kit since they are 16 gigabyte kits and you want to get two of those for dual channel, you will need to fork out an additional 500 Aussie dollars for that as well. So all up, the bare bones, once we haven't even added in the cooler, is going to cost you over 2,000 Aussie dollars. Now in the US, I'd imagine the memory on DDR5 will at least cost around 300 US dollars for a 32 gigabyte kit. The motherboards, I'm guessing an entry level board, will at least be 300 USD or more. So when we start adding up all those costs, and if we wanted to get something like the cheaper i5-12600K, then you are going to have those additional costs, which is gonna make it pretty much one of those things where you'd probably just wanna get the 12900K at this point in time until cheaper DDR5 and cheaper motherboards roll around. And with all that out of the way, I hope you guys enjoyed today's gaming performance review of the i9-12900K versus the Ryzen 9 5950X. And it's good to see that Intel is finally hitting hard against AMD because the years prior, they've pretty much let AMD walk all over them and AMD got that performance crown, but it looks like Intel is taking it back. And what we see from here on in can only mean good things for consumers, especially if you wanna get the best performance. And ultimately, as we all know with competition, this means that the consumer does end up winning in the end. But that said, competition does work between manufacturers as well. So hopefully that drives prices down within DDR5 and also motherboard. So of course, I look forward to reading your questions and comments down below. Do let us know what questions you have. In terms of the Windows 11 testing we did here today, I did make sure the 5950X had the latest updates. It was running smoothly and did have its best foot forward versus the 12900K. And I was doing some tests before to make sure I was getting the best performance on Ryzen before giving you guys these numbers. Anyhow, guys, I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.